Today is my 89th birthday, and to my very considerable surprise, I find myself in a place uh, that I've never been to before, and which it is a great, great privilege to visit, the White House, with the President of the United States. The Oval Office is surely one of the most famous uh, rooms uh, in the whole world, uh, where history has been enacted, the home of arguably the most powerful man uh, in the world. Uh, so to go to it uh, is a huge privilege, and perhaps a rather daunting one at that. Uh, all I can say was that it was not made to seem daunting and the President of the United States uh, spoke to me uh, in as friendly a term as I could possibly imagine. Friendly and hospitable and genuine. It was uh, an extraordinary experience which I shall never forget. Sir David Attenborough, thank you so much for uh, being here. As I was telling you in our walk over, I have been a huge admirer of your work for a very long time. Um, I have to say, though, that when I heard that you had uh, gone down, you had, you had dove into the Great Barrier Reef again, 60 years after the first time you did it? Yes. Uh, uh, that, that impressed me. Uh, but I was in a, in a sub. I mean, I was in a very, very remarkable research sub, uh -huh. and we went down to over 300 meters. Oh, so you went, you went uh, way down there. And that was just mind-blowing, of course. Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, t tell me how the Great Barrier Reef looked to you today compared to the first time uh, that you went there, and, and, and what's your, what story does that tell us about uh, how, how we're doing in, in conserving these incredible treasures? Well, of course, the whole population of, of Australia has increased a very great deal. So the population up the east coast of, uh, of Queensland has, has grown, and so has industry. And wherever there are human beings and wherever there's industry, there are consequences. Right. And the consequences on a coast are likely to be not too good for the reef, that, right. which is quite true. Um, and uh, the Australians are addressing that. The, the real problem on the reef is, is, is the global one, which is what is happening with the increase in acidification and the rise in the ocean temperature. And uh, the, the Australians have, have done research on coral now, and they know for sure that if, it, if they go up beyond a degree or a degree and a half and so on, uh, it will kill coral. Right. will kill the species of coral. Right. And what they're concerned about now is, I mean, that seems almost inevitable. Right. What it seems now is, is can, they, can they find the right species to maintain the reef's population? Right, so, so really uh, there's a mitigation strategy that they're trying to come up with, but uh, what we're seeing is global trends uh, that uh, depend on the entire world working together. Yes. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, it seems as if we haven't made as much progress uh, as we need to on climate change. Now, y given the work that you've done, though, uh, you know, the good news is, is that there are some areas where we have made progress. We've been able, to, uh, here in the United States, for example, with the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act, uh, to clean up areas that 20, 30, 40 years ago seemed like they'd never recover. And once we took some sensible steps, it uh, turns out that nature uh, was, was fairly resilient, but, uh, but it required us being fairly uh, intentional and, and, and uh, uh, really go at the problem uh, in a serious way. It's, cer it's certainly, uh, uh, the, the, the resilience of the natural world is, is, gives you great hope, really. Right. Given nature half a chance, it, it really takes it and works with it, but we are throwing huge problems at it. Uh, and the the, uh, the rising in temperature, global temperature, is is a very very serious worry indeed. Uh, it seems to me. Um, what what worry, what concerns me is that when we are sitting in Europe, we see what you did by uh, saying we're going to put a man on the moon right. in ten years. Right. Supposing you said. In 10 years, the United States will organize and the world and energize the world to find a solution, to find a, a, a way of producing energy with no problems. That is to say, exploiting sunshine ex to, to a degree and finding ways of storing 
electricity, because if you did that, so much would be, some problems would be right. solved. Well, that's what, we're, that's what we're going to be shooting for. I mean, we've made enormous investments. Uh, we doubled our investment in clean energy here in the United States. Uh, I just last year came back from China with an agreement from the Chinese to work with us on reducing emissions. But we're not moving as fast as we need to. And the uh, part of what uh, I know from watching your uh, programs and, and uh, all the great work you've, you've done is that uh, you know, these ecosystems are, uh, are all interconnected and that uh, if just one country is doing the right thing but uh, other countries are not, uh, then we're not going to solve the problem. We're going to have to have a global solution to this. And the, and the solutions are global, have to be global. And that has been the huge uh, encouragement over the past 10 years that the United States and indeed China two vast important nations have actually agreed right. to take these steps. That surely will go down in history as epoch making. Right. But it's, but so the job is not yet done. No, we're, we're far from it. Now, let, 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 me, let me backtrack for a second. How did you get interested in, in nature and wanting to record it? When you think back after this storied career, uh, well, what is it that uh, led you to such a deep fascination with, uh, with how the natural world works? Well, I've never met a child who's not, fascinated. Who's not interested in natural history. So, the, I mean, just the simplest thing, a, a five-year-old turning over a stone and seeing a slug, you know, and says, what a treasure. You know, well, how does it live? What are those things on the front? Kids love it. Kids understand the natural world and are fascinated by it. So, you, so you, the you, question you is, how did you world. lose it? How did anyone <laughs> lose the interest in nature? Yeah. And certainly I never lost it. Yeah. But if you do lose it, and I imagine there are lots of other attractions that can make divert your attention, you've lost a very, very great treasure. At what point did you decide that uh, you, you wanted to uh, make it your life's work to, to help record it? And, and that, I don't think I ever dared say it was a nice work, because after all, when I, when I started, there wasn't any television. Uh, and all I knew was I wanted to try and understand the way the world works, the natural world works. It's a uh, it, great fascination. And, uh, and so I took um, zoology and natural sciences at university, but then I had to go into the Navy. It was the end of the war, and I was conscripted into the Navy for a couple of years. Um, and then I got it, when I came out, I, I didn't think I was I cut out to be a, a proper scientist. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I, I went into television and, and managed to... I was going to say manipulate television to allow me to go and see these wonderful things, which is what I've been doing ever since pretty well. When, when you think of uh, your, your favorite trips or your favorite discoveries or places in the world that um, you, you, you wish you could take everybody to so that they could really appreciate uh, what this marvelous uh, gift that we've gotten uh, is, uh, what, what, what comes to mind? Well, I, I think you would agree with me that the, the moment you first dive on a, barri on a coral reef <clears throat> with tanks so that you are weightless, that being in weightless is, is enough to make a memorable uh, event for you. But when you can do it on a reef with this multitude of multicolored organisms, the like of which you've never seen before, and you can just with a flick of your a fin, you can go down or you can go up, and then you can see these great sharks and things coming in from the ocean, that surely has to be one of the great sensations. It's a new world. Well, the, uh, you know, growing up in Hawaii, uh, it, it, it was one of the things that, that taught me uh, not only to appreciate nature, but also that you had to care for it. And uh, you know, because we spent so much time outside, um, and I think there was part of the Native Hawaiian culture that is true of many Native cultures, the sense of uh, needing to uh, care for the environment that you're in, uh, that uh, sometimes we lose when we live in big cities. Um, the interesting thing is though, my, my daughters, I, I find Malia and Sasha, who's, they're 16 and 13 now, they're much more environmentally aware, uh, this generation, than I, I think I some that. previous uh, generations. They, they, they do not dispute, for example, the science around climate change. Uh, no. they, they think it's uh, self-apparent that we've got a problem and that we yeah. should be doing something about yeah. it. I, I absolutely agree. Certainly the letters I get, they bring tears to the eyes yeah. from kids of all ages. Uh, and and the, the young people, 
they care. They know that this is the world that they're going to grow up in and they're going to spend the rest of their lives in. Right. But I think, it's, I think it's more idealistic than that. They actually believe that humanity, human species, has no right to destroy and despoil regardless. Right. They actually feel that very powerfully. They do, yeah. When you think about 40 years from now, um, what are the what are the prospects for this uh, blue marble that we live on uh, in the middle of space? Do you, do you get a sense that we're going to uh, be able to get uh, ahead of these problems? Uh, do you think that uh, you know, with, with the prospects of climate change, rising populations, that um, it's realistic for us to be able to uh, get a handle on these uh, issues and, and reverse some of the problems? Uh, or are, are you more pessimistic? I believe that if we find ways of generating and storing power from renewable resources, right. um, we will make the problem with oil and coal and other carbon problems right. disappear right. because economically we will wish to use these other methods. Right. And if we do that, right. a huge step will have been taken yeah. towards solving the problems of the earth. Well, I, I, I think you're right about that, that, that there's got to be an economic uh, component to this. I, you know, my father was from Kenya, and uh, I still remember the first time I went to Maasai Mara and uh, the Serengeti and, and saw the Great Migration. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, going back into the Garden of Eden when you see the wildebeest and the zebras and, and you're transported. Um, but I remember talking to the rangers out there. and. You know, they're dealing with issues of poaching and uh, other problems, but the principal problem initially that they had was that the populations around the parks didn't feel any in economic incentive to help preserve it. And uh, when, when the, the national parks started to work with the local farmers and saying to them, there's ways for you to do well while still conserving, this uh, great uh, treasure that uh, we have, uh, that's when you've got cooperation. And I think all, all too often we, we pose this as an economic development versus environment problem rather than recognizing that there's a way of marrying those two concerns. That indeed is the case, but the trouble is that as fast as you find solutions along those lines, right. the problem grows bigger yeah. because the increase in population in, right. in Kenya is, is very, very serious. considerable. Right. And it's very difficult if you're growing a family and you want to grow your own right. food and so on. And you can see all that space right. occupied by elephants or whatever. Right. So what, what about us? Right, exactly. And, and, and that's population's I mean, yeah. growth is one of, the, one of the huge problems. Yeah, well, the, which is why uh, we're spending a lot of time, including working with my wife around uh, issues of uh, girls' education. Turns out that when uh, young women are uh, getting proper schooling and see opportunity, uh, they're less uh, likely to have uh, children early uh, smaller families, population stabilize. Uh, and so it actually ends up uh, helping not only those young women uh, succeed and look after their children, but it also helps uh, the, the, uh, Certainly, sir. You know, the, uh, the environment. So, the, so you, ha you have to have a literate, uh, informed uh, population with right. medical understanding of what right. problems are and what's available. Right. And, and then the population, the birth rate falls. It's not the end of the story, but right. the birth rate fall, falling is the start right. of the solution. Right. The, the Internet's uh, been a, a powerful tool, though, for this generation, I think, to become aware of all the wonders of the world. Uh, you know, when, when you were starting off, uh, maybe you could get a program on once uh, every so often. Now, uh, on your telephone, you can see uh, you know, glaciers and, yeah. and uh, the Amazon. And well, it is an extraordinary paradox, isn't it, that, that the United Nations tells us that over 50% of the human population of the planet are urbanized, right. which means that to some degree they are cut off from the natural world. Right. And after all, some people are totally cut off. They don't see a wild creature from dawn till dusk, unless it's a rat or a pigeon. Right. Um, and, and, and yet at the same time, mass media can get informed those people as to what the natural world is. Yeah. 
Uh, and if, unless they under, don't understand, if they don't understand about the workings of the natural world, they won't take the trouble to, to protect it. That's one of the roles that the media should have, yeah. of ma maintaining a link between the population and the nat an understanding of what goes on in the natural world. Because why should they give up money on taxes, come to that, to protect the natural world, yeah. unless they actually care about it? Right. The, uh, have you had a chance to uh, travel much in the, uh, through our national parks in the United States? Because uh, you know, one of my predecessors, uh, t uh, Teddy Roosevelt, started uh, the oh, national sorry. parks, and uh, yeah, yeah. I it, mean, it, what a legacy that's been. You, you, the United States was the was the model for the world. Yeah. I mean, Yosemite and so on, and the founding of those great national parks. Right. Yes, indeed, have I travelled there, and boy, what a wonderful time one has there. Yeah. And great lodges and great treks and. Yeah. and and the space still, it doesn't matter how, you know, all these visitors come and yet you can still yeah. be alone up there, up in the Yukon or wherever. It, it's one of the great, uh, I think, secrets of the United States is how big it is and there are big chunks of it that are still undisturbed. And when you fly over the country, uh, you're reminded about what a, what a blessing it is. There, there aren't many places with such low density where you can just walk for miles. Well, uh, to have in your own country the Okefenokee Swamp down there and the glaciers of Alaska up, up there yeah. um, and the Yosemite and the Rockies over there, oh gosh. Yeah. Well, th this is part of the reason why w what we've uh, been doing is trying to initiate ways to get more children and young people to use the parks. And as you said, so many of these kids are growing up cut off, they're sitting on the couch, they're playing video games. If they experience nature, it's through a television screen. Uh, and just getting them out there so that they, they're picking up that rock and finding that slug. And they're seeing that, uh, that bird uh, with, with colors that uh, they And they're earning a bit before. of self-reliance too. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very diff difficult if you've never been in outside right. to, to find yourself in a forest. Right. I mean, I've, I've been humiliated enough <laughs> in, in Amazon forests and losing myself. I mean, that, and you really do feel an idiot. Uh, with the, 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 and the local people, tribes people, look at you and you think, you're lost? You know, what, where were you grow, brought up? <laughs> the answer is not in the forest. Yeah. But kids can learn and they love it when they do. And, and if, if you were to think about how we could raise awareness, because you've been a, a great educator as well as a great naturalist, how, how, do you, uh, how, how do you think we can reach the public uh, around these issues, not only to make them aware of the dangers of an issue like climate change, but also to feel a sense of agency and uh, capacity uh, to change it? Uh, an another way of asking this is maybe, what do you think are some of the most stubborn uh, misconceptions about nature that, uh, that lead us not always to get out in front of these problems? I think only unfamiliarity. And I don't see uh, how you can hope to take somebody who has spent the first 16 years of his life surrounded by bricks and mortar and then suddenly puts him in the middle of a rainforest and expect him to find his way or to know how to live or indeed how to survive and find food. Um, so, and I'm not sure that that is absolutely necessary anyway. I think what is required is a, a, an understanding and a gut feeling that you understand that the natural world is part of your inheritance. Right. It is, this is the planet on which we live, it's the only one we've got right. uh, and it, we've got to protect it. And people do feel that deeply and instinctively right. uh, and it is after all um, the natural world is where you go in moments of celebration and in moments of grief. It mm. is, it is a, the greatest prop and stay to humanity's own, own feeling for himself, itself, herself, ourself. Yeah. No, it's, well, you know, if you think about, um, you know, in, in all the world's religions, uh, you know, when you're seeking wisdom, you're, you're seeking to hear God, you're in the desert, or you go to great waters, or you go up to great mountain peaks. Um, you know, recapturing that sense of wonder uh, and uh, the, the, the amazement of the natural world and its powers. Uh, you know, that, that's what 
uh, speaks to what's deepest in us. And you know, the, the, what's, what's critically important is making sure that we're passing that on to future generations. Uh, you, know, you and I, we've, we've been blessed to be able to see it. Uh, and experience it and and, uh, and be moved by it and uh, I want to make sure that my daughters and uh, their children uh, are experiencing that same thing.